There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I am quite disappointed that I'm filming this inside. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. I think it's plus 14 or something at 7 a.m. But my gout is not well enough. I was dressed, I packed up, ready to go out, but I just can't. My foot is not in good enough condition. I would have regretted it for the rest of the day because I do plan to hobble out and teach some classes. Uh, in the real world, in cafes later today, so I uh, better uh, not jeopardize some much needed income later in the day. There will be many other al fresco Friday reads, so I hate filming in the living room because I don't like the lighting and this and that, but my husband is sleeping. What can I do? I'm going to be talking at normal volume, and I have so much to tell you. I've had an extravagant jam-packed reading week. So let's dive in, shall we? I have two bales to tell you about. I didn't get very much further with this novel that everybody but me in the world adores. Temporary by Hilary Leichter. I really liked her when I heard her interviewed on the podcast, but I didn't pay much attention to the fact that this is basically some kind of magical realism. It's not grounded in reality, and you know me. I don't do well with that. The first story where I realized it was happening I found amusing and I see that there was a larger point she was trying to make like much of magical realism and I'm not sure I'm using the right word maybe absurdism is more what this is. There is an underlying point but I, I just can't do it. Uh, I, I g g gave up for all the reasons you've heard me give up on this kind of stuff before. And it's kind of sad because, boy, does this cover match my blouse. And I also bailed on this collection of flash fiction from Ireland, Some Days Are Better Than Ours, by Barbara Bjar. I've never read flash fiction before. Everything I'd heard about flash fiction made me deeply uninterested in trying flash fiction. I have now tried it, and no, it's not for me. Um, there was a couple of these that I really quite liked, and... I think it's just a matter of personal taste rather than anything about the quality of these very short stories. Um, most of them just gave me a headache because I just don't like... Some people really respond to starting a story and not... And it being... Is, that, is the word defamiliarize? De defamiliarization techniques where you don't know what's going on or what's, what's happened. You just can't get an anchor and it, it takes a few pages to kind of get your footing as the reader and when it's a page and a half story I never did get my my readerly anchor with most of them and I just don't like that kind of reading so I didn't get very far into it 42 pages but it's uh, something that a lot of other people enjoy and if you're into flash fiction I think you probably would enjoy it unbelievably this might be a weekly record for me. I finished six books. I mean, of course, I didn't start them and finish them this week. None of them. Maybe one I almost did, but I did finish a whole bunch, including this, A Ghost in the Throat by Doreen Nagrifa. And this was for the Irish Readathon, and I quite enjoyed it. This is a blend of memoir, a biography, and auto fiction, a little bit of auto fiction thrown in. It's by a poet, so it's also written very poetically. I struggled with some aspects of that. In other words, it wasn't a five star read, it was a four star read, so I didn't struggle that much. Doreen Nagrifa, her whole life, was obsessed with the Irish poet. I believe the pronunciation, which I just played for you, and I would say that is Eblin Dove Nihono. A Irish poet from the uh, 18th century, in the 1700s, and she ended up living in the same part of Ireland where this poet had lived centuries before. And she became even further obsessed with this poet as she was a uh, young mother. So this book is a combination of her experiences throughout her life up until when she was starting to raise a large family and how that connected her 
all the more deeply with Evelyn Dove Nihonol's life and poetry. I'm not sure that I was convinced that the two texts, Nagrifa's life story and her research into and resultant biography of the poet from the 18th century, that there was as much of a interplay between them and that they were vitally connected texts. But ultimately, I didn't care because she's such a good writer. I was almost as interested in Doreen Negrifa's autobiographical writing in here as I was in what she discovered and what she told me about Evelyn Dove Nihonol's life back in the 18th century. Yet, I didn't know that they necessarily needed to be all in the same book. So in other words, uh, other readers, probably female readers, could see the connection, could feel the palpable, visceral connection between the two stories. At certain points, I could. I certainly was convinced about how rooted in Nagrifa's own life her love for an obsession with this poet was. I did feel like I was reading two stories that didn't really connect. But I loved the story about the 18th century poet, and I really liked the story about Doreen Negrifa. So, four-star read. I was a nerdy kid. Are you surprised? So I was obsessed with genealogy from about the age of 10 to 20. And by the, I think I was the age of 16, I became a professional genealogist. So the historical research that she chronicles in here, I really connected with. And she made that obsessive researching really palpable on the page. Um, I recommend it very highly. Michelle Gallen's debut novel, Big Girl, Small Town, 2020 novel uh, that I read for Irish. I did it about half audio only and half reading while listening to the audio. And what a treat. Just a delightful five-star read for me. It's a bit of a Mormite book. It has a fairly low rating on Goodreads, which I was surprised at. I think it's because of the neurodiverse narrator. I don't want to insult people that didn't like it by saying that they didn't connect with the narrator. So I would have to think about that some more. But Magella is in her late 20s in a rinky-dink little town in Northern Ireland. It's just a few years after the peace accord has been signed. The benefits of that have not really shown up in this economically depressed backwater type town. And she is presumably autistic. It's never stated what is her particular neurological challenge. I found her narration absolutely fascinating, unforgettable. I can't believe this is a debut novel. Her grandmother in the same town has been murdered just a couple days before the story opens because Magella sees the world and handles the world and shuts out certain aspects of her experience that are too overwhelming. It's, it's a very weird feeling because the funeral had just happened. There are news reports about the murder. Her other family stuff going back to during the time of troubles. An uncle was killed trying to plant a bomb. Her father disappeared. All of that is narrated with notably flat affect. And I'm guessing that some readers just didn't connect with the story because of that. Whereas for me, it opened up all these deep thoughts for me as a reader about unreliable narrators in a way you had to kind of read between the lines of this story. And that process made me just fall in love with Magella. I just loved her so much. I loved the quirkiness of all the people in the town. She worked at a fast food joint, a salt and batter, fish and chips, basically, was it fish and chips? And sausage, <laughs> fried, deep fried sausage and chips and so on, a salt and batter. I just thought it was a, an incredible literary achievement to tell this kind of story through this kind of narrator. Maybe if I end up being able to articulate some of those deeper thoughts about the unreliable narrator thing, because it did spark a lot of ruminative activity in me as I was reading, I will do a full review because this was absolutely incredible. It had humor, 
It did have a strong emotional undercurrent. The characters were so well drawn and such quirky characters. People of the town, this economically depressed town that would come in on a regular basis for their fast food. And the way that Magella would process things and categorize things and make endless lists. The structure of the novel is almost in the form of listicles of things that she doesn't like and things that she does like. The audio narrated by somebody famous from the Dairy Girls, Nicola Coughlin maybe, was absolutely incredible as well. A real hit for me for the Irish Readathon this month. Much less successful. One of the biggest disappointments of my 2020 reading life thus far is this collection of Japanese short stories, Inheritors by Asako Serizawa, originally written in English. Serizawa is a Japanese writer. And she writes in English. This was a months-long buddy read with Britta Bowler, and we just finished it this week. I didn't like it. Way, way, way too cerebral for me. While much of the writing was really good, too much of it read like essayistic commentary and historical commentary. There were moments of vivid character work, but it just didn't work. There were some stories I liked better than others, but none of them, I didn't like any of them very much. So two-star read, just not a Sean book. I think other more cerebral intellectual types might uh, connect with it better. Certainly what she was attempting to do is fascinating to me, tracing the impact of Japanese history on several generations of a Japanese and then Japanese American family. And probably the most interesting part of the whole experience for me was it's got a family tree, including references to which stories, which characters get talked about in. It was me kind of tracing that. There's the genealogist in me that was far more interesting than anything that I read in the book. I really disliked the writing fairly intensely, so I do not recommend it. But um, also, if you don't like what Sean the Book Baniac usually likes, you might like it. I finished The 101 Dalmatians. I'm not going to spend much time talking about it, but it was a trip down memory lane. And it's the first positive experience I have had of rereading a text, a children's story that I loved as a kid, so I am going to continue with that. I didn't remember the story, I fell back into it, loved it, five stars. I want to read more by Dodie Smith, I want to read more of the books that I loved as a kid. I may start another one fairly soon, but yes, The 101 Dalmatians, I don't think I ever saw the movie. Still don't really care to see it, but the book I might reread again because it was that good. <laughs> and I, I'm not a dog person. I'm not a pet person. I think I was more of a pet person when I was a kid. This book kind of got me thinking. I've, I actually enjoy dogs in literature far more than I do in real life, and this, this was just a delight. I had a really good experience with this novella from Libya. And it's the first novella from Purine Press that I've liked. Under the Tripoli Sky by Kamal Ben Hamida, translated from the Arabic by Adriana Hunter. And I found out that Hamida has lived in Europe since he was in his 20s. I think he's 51 now, 54 maybe. And he is a jazz musician. This is his first work, work of fiction. He has also published volumes of poetry. I don't know if they've been translated into English. Do I know for sure that it was translated from Arabic and not? Uh, what else is Adriana Hunter translated? <laughs> yeah, she translated Amélie Nothomb and so on. So I think that it was originally written in French and translated from French into English. Okay, clarified that. It was really good. I just finished it yesterday and I'm finding that it's, I'm thinking about it a lot today. And if that process continues, I might up it to a five-star read. But it was a lovely portrait set in the 1960s in Tripoli, Libya. And this boy, the boy uh, narrator, he's just on the cusp of adolescence. It opens with his circumcision ritual. And the men in his life, his father and uncles and this and that, they are very involved in that circumcision ceremony. And then we never see any of those men again. And he, he spends his time eavesdropping on, spending time with, and just generally preoccupied with the women in his life. His mother, 
many aunts, many of his mother's friends, and a few younger women or other women that um, he is tempted to and does explore his sexuality with. It was such a female-centered novel, and I think it's one of the most female-centered, and I mean that the preoccupation of this text was so much on the women's lives, not the, the teenager wanting to get off with them. There was a little bit of that that I thought was sensitively depicted, but mostly he was just drinking in the stories that these older women, his mother and his aunts and so on, were telling him about their lives that were marred by misogyny. And there was a lot of humorous stories as well, a lot of, what's the word for when you kill your husband, something side, husband side, um, and fantasies about that, that I was cheering for those women. Uh, it was really interesting. 99 pages packed with all these stories set in a time during the independent phase of Libya, post-colonial, before Gaddafi started screwing everything up. What a slice of life. I really recommend it. And finally, the last, also for Invisible Cities, Loop by Brenda Lozano, a Mexican writer, translated from the Spanish by Annie McDermott. I liked it too. I didn't love it, but I liked it. Four stars. A short little novel about a young Mexican woman and basically we're reading her journal and she is a very thoughtful playful creative woman waiting for her boyfriend to come back after his mother's death her live-in boyfriend goes to Spain to bury the ashes or something and he's gone for quite a while and she loves this boyfriend very dearly and if she's not sure how the relationship will change or if the relationship might actually end because of his grief. And boy, that sounds like it could be really angsty and it's not. It's just really humane and human. She had been in some kind of an accident that entailed a long physical recovery just before she met this boyfriend. And we don't ever get much about what the what the accident was, but just many references to how long her recovery had been. And she is a writer, and so it's like a writer's journal with a stream of consciousness thoughts. Some of them seemed naive or I kind of rolled my eyes at, but most of them just made me not quite fall in love with, but made me come to care about the narrator. I like character study type fiction. I could have done with a little bit more story in this one, to be honest, but it was memorable. She was fascinated by people and things on a scale. She was fascinated by dwarves. She was fascinated by size. She was fascinated by many writers from South and Central America. She was fascinated by notebooks, if not obsessed with them. Didn't always make for a compelling narrative, but I quite enjoyed it. So that happened. All right, so that's what I finished. Holy smokes. And I've uh, started three. I am just 30 pages into this Irish novel, translated from the Irish. This Road of Mine by... Hello, everybody, and welcome to the launch of This Road of Mine by Shosam Magrina, and translated by Michal O'Hay. Shosam Magrina, I've been not pronouncing it correctly, apparently. Shosam Magrina, translated by... Mahilo um, Hey. I'm enjoying it. I'm just barely into it. The narrator, I think it's autofiction because the narrator is Magrina. Okay, now I've finally learned it's Magrina. Macgriana. I did find pronunciations online. Macgriana, but she said that for the book launch, Magrina. I didn't notice that till now. I do get it eventually, people. So the first person narrator, whose name is Magrina, is a. Uh, a little bit cantankerous and uh, fiercely independent, a little bit prickly, and I'm enjoying that so far. There aren't very many footnotes, but I'm finding the footnotes really interesting. So uh, he works, I don't know how much of it's autobiographically true, but the main character works translating non-Irish novels into the Irish language, and he does that under the auspices of a government department. I won't try and pronounce it. And his family history in the province of Ulster and talking about the ancient family that he comes from. And I have fallen down several rabbit holes already while reading this and looking forward to continuing. 
Una by Alice Lyons. I'm about uh, 12% in. I'm enjoying it. I'm finding that these things, she didn't allow herself to use the letter O. I always forget what that's called. So whatever that literary technique is called, Alice Lyons is really creating something quite compelling. About a young Irish girl, she's grown up part of the time in America, and she her mother dies when she is young. Her mother never told her teenage daughter that she was dying. She died of cancer and died at home, and there was nurses coming and going, but her daughter was never told how serious the illness was, or even that it was cancer. But she also willfully ignored but she was young. I think she was 13 or 14. And this is in New Jersey. So it's an Irish uh, family that had moved to the States. Uh, there's lots of stuff up also set in Ireland. So I'm not sure how, where the story is going. But she develops an early interest in art, nurtured by her mother, and the descriptions of art making and color. So what I'm noticing about this not being able to use the letter O... I would say 10% of the time, or maybe less, 5% of the time, I'm thinking, you know, you had to say that in such a strange way because you couldn't use the letter O that it's kind of silly. But in 90 or 95% of the time, I'm thinking, wow, the language that she has pulled out of herself, it's so fresh and powerful because of not being able to use, so not using the typical words. I don't know what percentage of words in the English language have the letter O in them, but not being able to use any of those words. So I'm enjoying it. It's very early days. I think it's mostly a big success for me. And I am 30% of the way into the graphic biography of Rosa Luxemburg, Red Rosa by Kate Evans. Really enjoying it. Yeah, really enjoying it. I didn't remember very much about her. I'm getting a remedial education in Marxist-Leninist theory, and that's, you know, not too much, but enough. Britta was teasing me because it's very philosophical. Politi political philosophy, to me, there's at least a point to it. It's the philosophy, philosophy that is just ridiculous, and so far there hasn't been any of that. <laughs> so I'm enjoying it. She was a character. She was more than a character. She was a really important intellectual presence that helped shape 20th century politics and history. So I have started those. So I am going to be starting a whole bunch of stuff because the next Friday Reads will be on April 2nd. So I will have just gotten a bare start on Aussie April. I'll put a link to my TBR and the chat I had with James of Costa Cover Critic about Aussie Lit. I'm really excited about getting into those and also some other books including Invisible Cities. Invisible Cities for April is Peru and I'll be starting let me sh I might as well talk about the Mario Vargas Llosa. Mario Vargas Llosa and Julia and the scriptwriter. I don't know anything about him other than he's Peru's most famous novelist. Wasn't he gay? I think so. Yes, he was gay. Is he still alive? I don't know. Uh, does anybody know if he's written um, queer novels? Aunt Julie and the scriptwriter, I'm not sure it's a Sean book. I'm going to try it. I'm curious. But it's 500 pages. It's a, it's a chunky book, and it's about the protagonist's aunt and a scriptwriter, and I'm just not sure it's going to be a Sean book. I have other Peruvian novels I've bookmarked on script, so, but can anyone recommend a Losa novel that's more up my street? in the queer literature department, please give me uh, some comments. But I'm going to start that. I think that's all I'll be starting next week for Invisible Cities. But the other two countries are Equatorial Guinea and Vietnam. And I've got some interesting choices lined up for that. Apropos of the fact that it's a new release that I pre-ordered, and I'm really curious about it, I'm also going to be starting this historical novel, a 2021 release, A Net of Small Fishes by Lucy Jago. But that cover, I don't know if you can see, it's very tactile, everything is really, it's a beautiful, beautifully put together book. It's set in London, 1609, and I can't get any idea of what the story is about from the uh, rather annoyingly evasive, <laughs> it's a little write-up, but it's set in London, 1609. An intoxicating bond between Frankie, a woman, I think, 
and Anne. I will know more by this time next week, hopefully. I'm going to give it a start. And for Aussie April, I'm going to start my two buddy reads. The Yield by Tara June Winch. This is a buddy read with Greg of Supposedly Fun. And also the canonical novel from about 1901, My Brilliant Career by Miles Franklin. This is a buddy read with Kim of Middle of the Book March. I'm starting that. And because it's the chunkiest novel on my Aussie April TBR, I'm also going to start The Slap by Christus Schulkes. That's quite a lot of things to start, and I've got two more to tell you about. These are long-term buddy reads. Heidi of My Reading Life and I finished our other book, and so in the coming week we will start this huge work of Canadian history. The Northwest is Our Mother, the story of Louis Riel's people, the Métis Nation, by Jean Taye. She is a lawyer and a historian and a descendant of Louis Riel's brother. I think Louis Riel was her great, great uncle or great, maybe great uncle. And this is a mammoth kind of people's history rather than being, I think it's not going to be overly academic, but a very accessible history of the Métis people. And what are the Métis people? Boy, um, that is a complicated question. The short answer, which is uh, wrong, and I have been called out on this many times, is that it's people that are uh, of mixed indigenous and settler background. That is woefully inadequate. It's actually a distinct cultural group and very much connected to Louis Riel, who was an important figure in Canadian history. And beyond that, I I will be able to explain it all, hopefully a lot more clearly and interestingly, after I've read this book. And I will be embarking on another uh, long-term buddy read of a short story collection. This is from India. It is called No Presents, Please by Jayant Kaikini, uh, translated from the Canada language by Tejaswini Niranjana. This will be a buddy read with Jatsna, of Jatsna's Bookscapades, one story a week. But serendipitously, I just found out about it. Jatsna has known this booktuber forever, but she is new to me, and I just kind of stumbled up upon a readathon of Indian literature in translation that's happening for the month of April. And that booktuber is Sant Reads. I'll put a link to her announcement video, and this is the fourth year I think she's done it. It's called Lit with Indian Lit, and it's specifically Indian Lit that's not originally written in English, but translated into English or whatever language you care to read it in. And that's exciting for me. Of the Indian literature that I've read, a percentage of it has been translated, and I have several books. I want to read at least one more this month that is translated, but this collection will fit into that quite well. And I think that you should take part in Lit with Indian Lit. Check out the uh, readathon announcement in the show notes. So that's what I'm planning to start. So I got my work cut out and expecting to finish a whole bunch of current reads in the coming week as well, which will make some space for these new books. And I'm going to have a lot to tell you next Friday too. Uh, I have cheered myself up talking about all these books and forgotten all about my sore foot. So uh, I hope that your foot isn't sore and that you too have had a fabulous reading week. Thanks for watching. Thank you.